In this video, we're going to jump into moving averages. We're going to talk about some of the different quantitative methods that are out there when looking at time series, and we're going to focus on moving averages um, and weighted moving averages. But I didn't even bother to say in the, in the title or the description of this video, we're also going to talk about the naive forecast as well. It is worth mentioning what the naive forecast is, and so I will, I will teach it to you. I, we will talk about it briefly, and then we're going to dive right into moving averages and weighted moving averages. So <clears throat> what is a naive forecast? A naive forecast is the forecast for any period that equals the previous period's actual value. Okay, the forecast for any period equals the previous period's actual value. The benefits of this kind of forecast is that it's easy to use. You don't have to calculate anything. It's great if you don't have a whole bunch of data. It's easy for people to understand. And in some settings, it can provide a high level of accuracy. So what a naive forecast means is, if I sold 10 widgets last month, I think I'm going to sell 10 widgets this month. If I sold 50 cars this month, then I think I'm going to sell 50 cars next month. If I sold 150 cupcakes, you know, this month, then I don't really know what to forecast for next month. So let's forecast 150 cupcakes next month as well. So that is a naive forecast when the forecast for any period equals the previous period's actual value. And again, in some settings, that might be the right call if you don't have a whole bunch of historical data or you really just don't know what sales are going to look like going forward. So they're simple to use. They don't cost a whole lot of money. They're easy to think through, and they do have a place, and that is a naive forecast. Okay, so now let's dive into moving average forecasts. First, we're going to talk about moving averages, and then we'll go into weighted moving averages. So a moving average, or an MA, is a technique that averages a number of recent actual values updated as new values become available. It works great for short planning horizons where there's no major trend, seasonal, or business cycle pattern. So I'm going to repeat that. Moving averages work great when it's a short planning horizon and there's no major trend, seasonal, or business cycle pattern. It does not respond well to changes. As the value of the N, okay, your N, which is your number of periods, uh, as that increases, the forecast reacts more slowly to recent changes in the time series data. So as you get more and more data, more time series, more ends, more number of periods, as you start adding that in, well, then your average is going to get diluted. So it's going to react more slowly to the most recent changes in events. So think about this conceptually. I'll go to the next slide to help. So think about what a moving average is. If you are averaging three months worth of data, 10, 12, and 13, let's just say March was 14 because it's easy for me to do that math in my head. If you take 10 plus 12 plus 14 and you average those together, that means your moving average, you just calculate it out to be 12. But if you're looking at it logically and you say, okay, sales have gone 10, then 12, then 14, well, maybe my next month should actually be a forecast of 16. So that's why when we're taking these moving averages, as you get more and more time periods into the calculation, it's going to make that data react more slowly to the more recent periods. So your formula for moving averages is simply the sum of the demand in the previous n periods divided by n. And n will be um, requested of you. So I'll either say I want a three month moving average or a four month moving average or a six month moving average, and that would be your n. So let's do an example together. Donna, her garden supply company wants a three month and a six month moving average forecast for her storage sheds, including the forecast for next January. Donna's storage shed sales are shown below. So you can see that she has actual sales data, and then now she wants to create a forecast for January using a moving average method. So how we do that is you take 10 plus 12 plus 13, and that gives you the three month moving average for April. So even though your actual shed sales were 16 in April, your moving average is gonna be 11.66 or 11.67 because you're taking the average of 10 plus 12 plus 13. 
and all you're doing is dividing them by three because that is your n. You have a three month moving average, so you're simply taking the last three months worth of data, dividing by three, and that gives you 11.67. And you can do this all the way down to calculate what your moving average would be for a three month period. So here's the actual sales. Here's the three month moving average if you were to do this calculation. And for April, to calculate April, you would take the previous three months periods of 10, 12, and 13. Now, some of you will get this wrong. If I were to ask you to calculate the three month moving average for April, you would take 16 plus 13 plus 12, and that would be wrong. So make sure when you're doing the moving average that you use the three months prior to that and do not include the current month. So now let's do this example together for Donna's garden supply. Pretty much gave you the answers on the previous slide already because we, we walked through uh, how you would go about calculating the forecast for April, but let's do it again together really quick. We're gonna be taking April, uh, to calculate April, we're gonna be taking March plus February plus January. Do not take April's actual sales into consideration, or like I just said, you will get that problem wrong. So you're going to be taking 13 plus 12 plus 10 divided by 3, and that gives you 11.67 for your April moving average. Now to calculate May, let's calculate May real quick. For May, you're going to be taking 16 plus 13 plus 12. You do not take the moving average forecast that we just calculated of 11.67 into consideration. You are taking the actual sales or demand the actual sales or demand, not the forecasted sales or demand. So make sure that if I ask you for a month, whether it's September or August or July, that you only look at the actual sales and you look at the previous N periods, not the current one. So for May, we would calculate 13.67. Donna wants us to calculate January. So you already have the answer on the screen. We know that it's 16, but we got there by adding up 14 plus 16 plus 18 when you add those three previous periods up and you divide them by three, that gives you a three month moving average of 16 for January. Okay, so Donna also wanted us to calculate a six month moving average. So it's the same formula, but in this case, we have an N of six because we want a six month moving average versus an N of three for a three month moving average. So we also have to get more data. We're going to get the previous six periods and take that into consideration for our moving average for six months. So all we do is to calculate July, because that's the first one we can do. We take 23 plus 19 plus 16 plus 13 plus 12 plus 10, and when you add those all up and you divide by six, you get 15.5 for your six-month moving average for July. Now, before I go any further, I already communicated that the more ends you have in, in your calculation, it's gonna be slower to adapt to changes. It is very clear if you just look at the actual sales that Donna has her best selling months in the summertime, June, July, August, September, you know, those are the high, that's the high peak month for her, for her sales. In the winter, January and February, uh, her sales are pretty low, they're 10 and 12. So we, want, just by looking at her historical data, we want this forecast to react quickly, not slowly. We want it to take into consideration the most recent month um, or the more current periods and put a higher weight on those. So in this instance, if you recall from the last slide, when we did a three month moving average, our answer for July, our forecast for July, gave us a forecast of 19.3. It was still wrong. It was 6.7 sheds wrong, which is a lot. But our six month moving average gave us a forecast of 15.5. So it's off by 10.5. That's really bad. So just to clarify, the data we're looking at here, this is a bad forecast. So we're just walking through the math together on how to go about doing a moving average. But if I'm Donna, I do not use a six month moving average as my forecasting method for sheds, because you can see that she is really far off from what actual sales were. Um, and that's because it adapts slowly, it moves slowly. So now let's calculate January real quick. So for January, 
We're going to add up December, November, October, September, August, and July. That gives us six months worth of previous data. And when we divide those by six, that gives us a forecast for 22 in January. Okay, so now let's go over weighted moving averages. Okay, this is where the more recent values in a time series are given more weight in computing the forecast. So what we're going to do is we're going to put more weight on the most recent periods, and that will help our forecast to adapt more quickly to the changes that it's seen. The moving average formula, which we've been discussing over the last couple slides, gave everything an equal weight. So every month, in the case of Donna, was given an equal weight. With a weighted moving average, we're going to put more weight on the most recent value in that time series. So how do we choose those weights? Well, in this course, I will give them to you. But when you are doing a forecast for your organization, trial and error. You're going to have to determine which ones work best for you. What kind of weighting do you want to put? as the weighted moving average. And so some trial and error, uh, testing out different theories, doing different analysis that will determine which weighted moving averages you want to use. So let's do that together. Uh, and before I do, uh, the weighted moving average formula is simply the sum of the weight for each period in N multiplied by your demand in period N divided by the sum of the weights. Okay, divided by the sum of the weights. So let's do an example together for Donna. Donna wants to do a storage shed forecast for three months, and she wants to apply the following weights. So last month, she's going to give a weighting of three. Two months ago, she's going to give a weighting of two. And one month ago, or three months ago, she's going to give a weighting of one. So last month, a weighting of three. Two months ago, a weighting of two. And three months ago, a weighting of one. When you sum those up, you get a total of six. Now you can also use percentages. She could go 60% for the last month. She could go 30% for two months ago, and then she could go 10% for three months ago. She could do that too. So you get to pick and choose which weighting method you want to use. You can use numbers, you can use percentages, um, but you have to sum up all of those totals and divide by that amount. If it is not given to you about uh, March equals three or February equals two, if it's not explicitly stated, you need to know that the most recent weight or the most recent period is going to be given the highest weight. It will always be that the most recent period has the highest weight. Okay, so for Donna, we are applying the weights of three, two, and one, and let's calculate out what April would be using a three-month moving average, a weighted three-month moving average. So for Donna, we're going to take March of 13, February of 12, and January of 10. We're going to apply our weights to them of 3 for March, 2 for February, and 1 for January. And when you add all of those up and divide by 6, your April forecast, your weighted moving average forecast for April is 12.17. Donna also asked us to calculate what it would be for January. What's her weighted moving average for January? So you can jump down and take December's data, November's data, and October's data. And when you add, apply the weights of three to the last month, which is December, two to two months ago, which is November, and one to three months ago, which is October. So three multiplied by 14, two multiplied by 16, one multiplied by 18, you divide that by six and you get a weighted moving average for January of 15.33. So we've now, for Donna's garden supply, we've done three different methods. We've done a three-month moving average, a six-month moving average, and a three-month weighted moving average. One thing I want to point out with, with Donna's garden supply is I've already kind of communicated that this is a, a poor forecast. We're off by a lot. If we look at July, if you go back to the last three slides, last couple slides, and you look through them, that using the three-month moving average for July, we had 26 actual sales. And the three-month moving average was a forecast of 19.3. So we were off by 6.7. Using a six-month moving average, we forecasted 15.5. So we were off by 10.5 sheds in the month of July using a six-month moving average. Using the three-month weighted moving average, 
we forecasted 20.5 for July. So we still had a variance of 5.5, but that was the best of the three methods that we used, okay? So that was still the best. This method that you see on the screen right now was the best method. We had the lowest amount of forecast variance versus our actual sales. If I work for Donna in the forecasting department, I personally would apply a much higher weighting to the last month or maybe even two months, something like seven, then two, then one, and the sum of my weights would now be 10 because I would put far more emphasis on the last month because you can see that she clearly has a seasonal trend. So I would want my forecast to react quickly, not slowly, and I would put a higher weight on the, the last period. So that's what I would do if I worked for Donna. Okay, some potential problems with moving averages. Increasing the end smooths out the forecast, but makes it less sensitive to changes. Kind of like what I just talked about a second ago. The more ends you get, the more periods you get, the more smooth that forecast is going to be, which may or may not be a good thing depending on your organization. Um, moving averages do not respond to forecast uh, trends well. They lag in the actual values. So if your organization has some, some trends that need to be taken into consideration, then um, the moving average is going to lag behind that. And it also requires extensive records of the past. So you've got to have a lot of good data to incorporate moving averages. Uh, for Donna specifically, uh, if you look at the number of sales uh, that she had, the blue line was the actual sales. And then these are the three things we just calculated out together. You can see the six month moving average, the green line had the highest variance between the actual sales and it lagged in catching up. So for these three months, she was under forecasted how many uh, sheds she was going to sell, sell. And in these months, in the winter months, uh, because she had that spike in the summer, the data was lagging behind. And so now she was over forecasting in the winter months because it, it had that lag in, in time between when the data caught up. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't quick to react. You can see based off of this chart that the weighted moving average was slightly better than the moving average three for Donna's garden supply. So again, if this were me, I would change, I would do that trial and error, and I would change the weighted moving average to be have a higher emphasis on that last period for the weighted moving average, and I would get it closer to that actual sales number. Okay, so now we've highlighted what a naive forecast is. We've discussed a moving average and weighted moving average. All of these are time series uh, forecasts.